The judges are ready to view your solution. You will have 20 minutes to present your solution to the judges. You'll be given a warning when five and two minutes remain. After 20 minutes, the presentation will be stopped immediately. No information will be considered after 20 minutes has left. Following your presentation, there will be 10 minutes of question and answer. You will be given a warning when two minutes remain. The question and answer will be stopped after 10 minutes. No information will be considered after that. You may begin whenever you are ready. Hi, welcome. Thank you for coming out this morning to listen to our presentation. This is Jacqueline James, Lisa Winters, Brian Chu, and I'm Caitlin Waller. So to start off the presentation, we're going to begin with a quote from David Waller, and it's on the Edward Jones Value Proposition. So it reads, deliver and tailored financial advice, guidance, and service through trusted personal relationships and a high level of personal service. This leads the way for all of the decisions that the company has made thus far. And looking into the future, there's a huge demographic shift in the financial advisees that the company currently serves. And right now we're at the forefront of an opportunity to continue to succeed in the same way that we have, but in integrating the new demographic trends. Now, who are these clients of the future? They could be the 92 million millennials in the United States, that make up 40% or one fourth of the United States total population, which is a number that can't go unnoticed, or they could be any number of the rapidly growing rate of um, minorities in the United States, which makes up about 30% of the total United States population, or they could be any number of the people who are going to receive the $30 trillion from the baby boomer generation. Now we realize that some people may have some of these qualities only, and others may have all of them. So we wanted to present you today with a example <coughs> uh, couple that we thought would give you an idea to paint a picture of who our client in the future could potentially be. So we have Amanda Lopez and Brian Baker, and they are um, and Amanda is Hispanic and Brian is Caucasian. And Amanda and Brian met at the University of Northwestern University in college, and they currently live in Chicago, which is a high, has a high millennial population, where they are currently dealing with their college debt. So they have an income in their household per year of 100,000, as Amanda works um, in sales, and Brian and Ryan works for, as an elementary school teacher. Uh, they they. Amanda is very tech savvy and likes Facebook a lot, and Ryan likes to spend his time outdoors running. They also are very socially conscious and have a lot of social issues that they're um, passionate about. And they also, uh, and Ryan's mom invests with Edward Jones currently. So growing up, he kind of had an idea for her experience and learned a little bit about investing from her. So the couple obviously now wants to find a trustworthy and low cost uh, financial advisor that they can have in order to plan for their future as a family, in order to plan for their retirement and also pay off their college debt. So like many millennials, uh, Ryan and Amanda were dealing with debt and have to understand the importance of saving for the future. They also are a diverse couple and they also um, have a one parent who currently invests with Edward Jones. And we recognize that millennials will probably uh, really value the fact that Edward Jones provides a trustworthy and a relationship-based um, interact interaction between the advisee and the advisor, and we think that they'll really value that. We also know that they're very tech savvy, and they have grown up in a generation where technology has been rapidly growing and changing. So we also know that millennials in the United States right now are at the largest amount that they have been in their generation. Uh, we know that they are currently very focused on working and spending, but they're also very focused on saving, which is something that we definitely focused on a lot because 
That's what we're trying to get them to do. And uh, we realize that this will have a very big impact on the economy in the future. So we have, um, currently, we have a few actions, which are knowledgeable financial advisors now that, um, that we work with, that work with our advisees, um, and they create that relationship-based environment like we also have up there. And they also have a diversity and mentorship program. And this is all goes through our um, the five the five key factors that Ever Jones presents, and that is to identify the target market, uh, in, uh, attract them, engage them, uh, serve them, and also retain them for the future. And then challenges going forward, we have uh, challenging demographics, so they're changing. Um, excuse me, changing demographics that we need to adapt to. We also have millennials having a new perspective, and we're also working towards integrating um, intergenerational wealth um, transfer. So in determining our solution for these problems that Lisa just presented, uh, we had a few steps that we had to make sure that we looked after in developing the solution. So the first that we looked at is alignment with the core values and capabilities. So something that we really noticed that within the case and in all the materials that we can gather about Edward Jones, we noticed that uh, they stressed like neighborhood values and the sense of community um, and really, as Lisa mentioned, you know, being able to connect with your clients on a really you know, core relationship kind of level. Um, so we wanted to make sure that all of our decisions came back to that. We also wanted to make sure it met with the company objectives, all of the five goals that Lisa just mentioned. Um, and there was also considerations of alternative uh, solutions. We dabbled with looking at uh, maybe different religious-based investments that might interest certain groups. Uh, we also dabbled with um, trying to outreach with millennials in different events. As you'll see, uh, we had our selection of our optimal solution. So. Our actual solution that we decided to go with is a three-pillar solution, and the first is marketing to millennials. As uh, Lisa just noted, there are many different uh, areas that millennials uh, provide to the marketplace, but that are also kind of a bit of a challenge, especially for companies that are used to kind of a baby boomer consumer base. So like targeting millennials will be a little bit uh, of a change of pace, but definitely a huge market potential in that sense. Uh, the next pillar that we're looking at is a uh, diversity incentive, and it's something that we would like to implement internally within the company uh, in terms of who we would be hiring. We know that Edward Jones is looking to uh, build from their current 15,000 uh, financial advisor base to a 20,000 financial advisor base. Um, so in looking for that additional 33% increase um, in the employee base, we're hoping to be able to integrate um, certain features. And then finally, we're hoping to integrate a legacy program where we would be able to attract the next generation uh, through their parents. So a little bit more about our solution. Looking at marketing to millennials, um, this generation is actually, despite what a lot of people think, is larger than the baby boomer generation. Um, they have very different views on cultural, social, and financial issues, um, and they're more open to the use of technology and diversity and inclusion. And that leads to our next point about wanting to have a diversity incentive in terms of how we recruit our newest employees. Um, there's minority populations that are rapidly increasing in the United States. Um, and there's a lot of, as the case kind of defined, as untraditional um, housing situations where there's a rise of single, same-sex couples, and multi-generational families living together. And finally, that leads to our legacy program which is kind of intra-family, and we noticed that there were $30 trillion um, in the next uh, few years that will be passed down from the boomers to millennials, and this is a huge you know, market potential for the companies to take advantage of. And we did some number crunching, and we noticed that there would be about $16 billion of current assets under management uh, that would be lost if this opportunity uh, isn't sought after. As Caitlin touched upon, we have a three-pillared solution to address the needs of our company. And um, in three, these three parts, we need to dive into how we're going to actually implement them in, in tactical objectives. So in terms of targeting the millennial group, uh, one of the key things that came to us in mind was the debt burden on millennials. So we want to offer debt seminars that our financial advisors would engage in the communities 
in order to attract millennials. 70% uh, uh, of millennials who go to undergraduate college have taken on debt to do so. Additionally, we would want to increase our technology platform to have an online chat format with your financial advisor. In addition to going into their office, once you get to know them, you can live chat with them about some of your questions that you may be experiencing. Um, and we'd also have a, a general hotline where you can message about more general questions to the, to the corporate uh, location. Um, and another key pillar of our strategy for targeting millennials is sustainability and social responsible, socially responsible investing. So in terms of the social responsible investing market, um, one, out of, one out of five dollars invested in professional management is actually geared towards a sustainable, um, socially responsible and impact investing funds. So um, we think this is a huge market opportunity and it really appeals to millennials as this generation is very cautious, uh, conscious of different social objectives that they have and are very passionate about certain social causes. And in particular, um, companies that in engage in social causes are 60% more likely to be viewed positively by millennials and companies who do not do so. In terms of implementing our diversity initiative, we want to attract high quality uh, financial advisors who will also help us reach this multicultural, um, internationalized, new future client of the millennial generation. And just to in line with the increased diversity in the U.S. demographics. Um, in particular, the, the three problems that we have for this are targeting multicultural um, people who have international experience, um, multicultural backgrounds, so that we can help engage with those types of client, potential clients. Additionally, we'd want to encourage uh, hiring of multilingual um, financial advisors who would be able to speak um, in the language of Hispanic clients or Arabic clients, etc. We also want to increase our gender diversity of financial advisors, as in order to influence our client base, um, having more female advisors would help to reach the clients as um, the majority of the six out of 10 um, households, the woman is usually the one who will have a large say over the financial decisions of the household. Um, and additionally, with the rise of more affluent uh, single women who are working, we think this is an attractive market and want to have that diversity in terms of multiculturally, multilingually, and uh, gender diversity in order to attract the future American client. Um, and additionally, this would go in line with uh, Edward Jones's a, a goal of increasing the number of financial advisors from 15,000 to 20,000 over the next um, five or so years. So we really want to use these as the base for that increase in uh, financial advisors. We also want to implement the legacy program. As Caitlin mentioned before, there's $30 trillion in U.S. financial assets that will be transferred over intergenerationally between now and 2050. We really want our, our company to get as much of the next generation as, as clients, uh, if maybe viewers die off and maybe transfer their assets towards the younger generation. Um, and we really want to attract the current clients who are making these intergenerational transfers to the younger generation. Um, we really want to keep that. And so the initiatives we have are keeping the same advisor as your parents. So you, maybe you grew up with an advisor and you're familiar with them and you want to keep that same advisor. Additionally, for new uh, initial accounts, we would waive the fees um, in the beginning so that, um, so that the, the children of current account holders would be more inclined to open an account with Edward Jones. And lastly, we would really focus on providing comprehensive estate and inheritance planning to meet the intergenerational transfer um, objectives of our clients. As you can see here, this projects forward from now until 2050, uh, the, the trillions of dollars that will be uh, transferred between generations. And so the main one being baby boomers to millennials. How this impacts Edward Jones is that um, based on your current assets under management and the annual percentage being transferred of assets, we project that $16.2 billion per year is being transferred to the next generation, and we want to maximize the percentage of that that we are retaining. We do not want these, uh, these children to go to a different financial advisor. It's really critical that we are targeting them and maximizing the assets under management we have with them going forward. So we have our you know, three-pillared solution, a lot of detail, but we wanted to see how financially feasible it would be. So this is the historical financial uh, snapshot and summary of uh, Jones Financial, Corp. financial um, LLP uh, over the last three years, just you know, basic income statement, nothing to build out too much. 
uh, some drivers at the bottom. Uh, so, you know, we built out a little bit of a model, just a very basic financial model based on historical growth, some of the some of our, our plans that we had you know, included, which will raise our cost, obviously, since we're hiring more advisors. Um, one of the big things that we were focusing on is how does assets under management, uh, under management uh, growth, does it increase and decrease? How does it relate to operating expenses as it compared to revenues? And we found that uh, our most important metric, our AUM, since we're right now just trying to get more volume, is, is uh, growing at a 6% cater over the next five years, which is our projection period for when we're growing our uh, financial advisor base from 15,000 to 20,000. A lot of our core drivers, our core drivers um, from this case were the fee revenue growth that we would achieve from getting more uh, assets under revenue, uh, under, man, under management, as that grows, so do your fees grow, so your fees grow too. But then your SG&A increases uh, linearly, as, uh, linearly as well because now we're hiring more financial advisors, we're opening more offices, we have to, you know, there's the costs associated with, um, also this is a proven strategy. Uh, more recently, um, Denver Jones has not really been growing in its financial advisor base, but it has historically in the past, and our projections are fairly, we think are fairly solid because it's how it has grown historically, and we are not doing anything too, too out there. Okay, so this is our projected our financial summary. So uh, we have the actual 2016 year completed as of December 31st, 2016, and we projected forward, just based on you know the core drivers that we had mentioned before, mostly mostly building off of the growth of our advisors. So, you know, uh, we ramped up because we have to get 5,000 5, new advisors in about five years. So we started you know, thinking, you know, take it slow at first, maybe hire 500 at first, and see how that goes. But there's, the, there's a period of time where your capital, essentially your capital expenditure, um, it's not realized immediately, so, you know, in terms of uh, financial advisors. So the next year, we will you know, put a little bit more than 750, and by that time, and we're sort of assuming that this process will be successful in our free pillar plan, you know, will work out. Uh, we'll ramp up to 1250 and then uh, 1000 and 1500 but that's subject to change depending on how things go. Uh, if you notice some assets under management, it's increasing the cater of 6.1%. Uh, very interestingly, essentially the net income to partners, the general partners, the management partners, and it's also creating a cater of 9.9%, which is uh, larger than before, mostly because um, of, uh, of, the revenue, of the revenue shift. So uh, some of our key risks, uh, the major one is you know, reaching our AUM target. We're hiring financial advisors because we want to grow our AUM because that's essentially the only reason. Yes, we would like to you know, get more neighborhoods and help more people, but end of the day, this is what we're here to do. But it's not, it's, it's not such that the more advisors we hire, is linearly we will grow you know, in, our, in our customer base. We, are, we have some strategies currently, hiring more diverse people, uh, people who not not racially, just racially, but culturally and uh, and number of languages they can speak. But it's very subject to see how it will actually turn out and how people will receive that. So another thing is our competition. Charles Schwab has the opposite business structure. They're tech focused. They're they're distant. You don't need your advisor really. You're focused on what you can do, um, uh, what you can do from the comfort of your home and easy based technology access based trading. Uh, it's a low cost, tech savvy competitor that's recently been gaining or popularity that overtaken us in one of the polls, but we, we're, we're confident in the future. Um, just as a, to, to, uh, to wrap up with a little less time, you know, we have our three pillars. The, as a solution, you know, the financial and demographic snapshot of America's change. Financially, all the wealth is going from the baby boom, boom, uh, boomer generation, and three trillion is being transferred in the next 30 to 40 years to the millennial population. Now they have financial power. They also have the, uh, just, you know, volume based power. There's, uh, Millennials will soon overtake the population of the baby boomer generation and they control the money. This is a fact. This is happening right now. It's already happened. The millennial generation ends at 1996. So, you know, we have to be very clear about what we're doing. We have to market to our millennials. We have to be very clear about what we're doing. Edward Jones is historically more of a conservative uh, company, but we have to perhaps uh, be more active in, in the liberal scene, which is what the, more of millennials are focused on maybe um, socially in San Francisco or New York and to some extent Chicago. Our diversity initiative, it cannot just be racially diverse. That's not enough. Uh, we have to hire people who truly understand the culture of the neighborhood that they're understanding in. You can actually connect with the people. Uh, if you can't speak the language, we have the same rights. It's not enough. Our legacy program is designed to uh, retain as much of that tr 30 trillion as possible. To us each year, from our 963 current asset under management, we'll lose 60 billion a year if we don't retain these customers. We have to start making our relationships, making sure they can go to shop, uh, and you know, 
what I, one of our ideas was um, you, you, uh, you open up free broker, brokerage accounts for the children or college accounts, checking accounts for free, and then you come in, sign some paperwork, meet your advisor, happens over, you know, meet twice or every three years or so, and that's how you uh, retain a customer and you don't want to leave, you don't want to go over to Schwab. So, you know, things are changing, they're changing fast, and we have to go adjust to it right now. Things are changing today, not really tomorrow, it's already happened. So, our three parts, uh, three point solution is our solution to that, and we have to start implement implementing it right now, ASAP. Uh, thank you, that's um, a representation, but we're here for Q&A. Oh, any questions, if, if anyone has any? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. This was uh, very, very, uh, very good. A lot of good information out there. Uh, my name is Hirsch Patel. Uh, I'm a local financial advisor in the area. And so it's very interesting for me to hear what you guys have to say, especially um, since some of the information that you guys have covered, uh, interestingly enough, is already being implemented at a firm. So very good to see that, that you guys have a similar perspective. A few comments, and, and then I do have a question for you. Um, real quickly, uh, I, I forget who had mentioned this, but uh, something about social media and, and being able, uh, being, having the capabilities of being able to text with your clients. As far as I know, I believe Jones is the only financial firm that has that capability, and it was recently launched. So it may not be published yet, um, but that, it was really cool that you guys were on the same path and, as, as what uh, we have recently implemented. And then second, as far as some of the stats that you guys were throwing out there, as shocking as they are, they're relatively true. And so um, and I, I do appreciate that information. One question that I do have, um, so one of the solutions in, in the legacy program, I believe, would probably carry a lot more weight than the other two in my mind. Um, and, and so I wanted to focus that on, on that one specifically. One of the key solutions was to lower or, or eliminate the, the, the fees for X amount of time. And so as you can imagine, um, time goes along and you're taking on more clients. If you're not charging them the fee, it's going to have an impact on your bottom line. And I've noticed the overall profit margin goes down over time. Okay. So, so can, can 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 you guys elaborate on that? How first off, how are we going to make this feasible um, so that way the profit margin potentially does not go down nearly at the rate that it was? Uh, and and second, um, is there another option such as maybe instead of charging a percent, charge 80 bips or something on those lines? So. I'd like to kind of turn that on to you guys and kind of see what you're... Yeah, absolutely. I'll take this with a snapshot. Absolutely. I, 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 use a, I, I miscommunicated one part of the legacy program. It was not eliminated all fees, which would uh, you know, essentially destroy the business model. Sure. But so let's say, you know, the parents or, or father or mother, whoever manages, has an account with uh, you already. Uh, let's say their son turns 15 or 16 and wants to open up a high school checking account or, or some sort of money market fund or something very basic. What, what I had more so meant to say was, let them like, open the account for free. I mean, uh, the, any management fee wouldn't be too high for them anyways because of the low asset management. But just like the, the act of letting them like, open um, open the account, maybe to get a few free trades or or just you know anything to get you in, in, in touch with them physically, have them sign the papers, they come in, talk to you a little bit, have, you know, have them twice a year or whatever it is, and then come time for college, you have a college checking account or a college savings account, stuff like that. Um, definitely don't want to eliminate uh, like, like all fees and the idea is that hopefully in time when they inherit whatever their percentage and allocation of the 30 trillion is, then, then uh, still, they're still with you because they know who you are and have less of an incentive to leave. Uh, about the bottom line, um, it, it, absolutely the, the problem already has decreased. Our uh, way of viewing it is that this is a long-term investment. We're planting the seeds right now. This millennial generation, that 30 trillion, that's happening over 30 to 40 years. So what happens in the next five years? Obviously matters. You know, this is a we're for a profit company, but I upped the uh, the operating expenses a little bit, like pretty significantly, by three to four percent to ninety one to ninety percent to ninety two percent at some point because we uh, just be conservative to see what would happen because we have to hire thirty three percent more financial advisors in a five year time period when over the past three years we've only hired maybe three hundred and three percent, which is just very normal. So. Um, that would be the reason for the bottom line, which I agree is, is definitely you know not something that it's good to have like lower profit margins, but at the same time, you know, we're kind of in for the long haul. I wouldn't project it further, but the further you project, the less accurate it, it gets. But this was just um, our, our our take on what a conservative look at it would be and if it was feasible or not, or as opposed to if it was um the objective like best thing that happened to the firm. Sure. No, no, no. I, and you know what I appreciate it. I just 
it's, it's just it's interesting because I was trying to put two and two together. Mm -hmm. and, and I think um, you're right. So actually, I, I will correct one fact there. It's net growth of 300. So it's not that they only hired 300 people, but in our industry, it's a very high retention. Mm -hmm. and, or, and, and there's constantly um, a turnover. We call it right. Yeah, so, attrition, right? So, yeah. so attrition, exactly. Right. So, so the point is, we've net grown by three hundred or whatever the number is. I, I don't know. That oh, is. I see. My point is, it's not just the higher three hundred. Less, less than nine percent, up ten percent. I see. I see your point. Yeah. So, so just okay. Just no, that's, that's, that's it. I, I, I didn't account so, for that. Yeah, that's. Well, I mean, fifteen hundred. You hire fifteen hundred. I believe this is a stat of Jones. Yeah. And it may be a little off at this point, but when I was training, uh -huh. seventy percent of people make it. Or something like oh, that. Oh, really? Okay, sure. 70 or 60 years. Okay. So, so the thing is, you know, you hire a few people, well, that. Okay, so maybe like you hire like 8,000, 5,000, right? you're trying to get to 20,000, not hire 5,000, you're trying to reach 20,000, however, that maybe you hire 20,000 people, and, you know, whatever. Yeah, okay. I, I see if that's a good point. Kind of to talk about waiving fees, it kind of sounds binary. Wave them all or keep them all, stuff like that. And, and in this day of discounts, like I was on retail me not last night, because I'm going to try to find a coupon for free shipping. So I'm sitting here thinking if you're dealing with parents and their children, and, and each local owner operator has to report sales or, or revenue and stuff like that, I'm thinking because you're a, a child of a long term parent. Maybe it's a 25% discount or something. I mean, everybody's going to get a discount. And then to me, it's the balance of what the rates are being charged by your nearest competitors, figuring out what's the balance so you can compete with them, get some revenue coming in, um, and, and don't give it all away, even if it's for you know, one year grace or something like that. So just, just a balancing thing uh, yeah. to be looking at. I, I was glad that. In, in your last segment there, talking about it's not a matter of just hiring insurance. So, what about the existing, was it 15,000 Edward Jones Financial Advisors? Uh, they're operating in, in diverse areas. Are, are you envisioning training programs for the existing FAs as well? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So, uh, the new 5,000 recruits are primarily focused through our uh, through our diversity initiative. Um, it, those are more ancillary for our existing financial advisors. So these 5,000 uh, new advisors are going through like new, like, like very new, and I don't want to say but like very different uh, training programs that maybe perhaps you had because this program had not been launched yet. So they have to learn, um, you know, how to how to deal with how to, how to better interact with people in their neighborhood. They're placed in more specific. Uh, Neighborhoods where they can, where they're more aligned, maybe they speak the, uh, a, a need, more niche language, maybe they've lived um, abroad in another country where a lot of immigrants from there come to this neighborhood. And of course, uh, I think it would be great if uh, we were thinking about offering the same thing uh, for the existing 15,000 uh, professionals to join these because they still have people in the existing neighborhoods that they operate in that they don't, uh, that they're not covering right now. They don't have 100% of the market, which, which they would, it would be great for them to have, but they don't. And these might be some of the barriers, and they might recognize that perhaps the demographic uh, that that they're operating within, they're not maybe they don't have like as much of a penetration as they want because of certain issues like this, because they just don't understand what people look for in their financial advice. Maybe they want to tax, maybe the millennials, maybe they're immigrants and they're not like that, and they want other things. So I think our uh, our idea was to to launch this to everybody, but not it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, First of all, I give you credit for the numbers up there. You have for the numbers up there. <laughs> it's always easy to shoot at numbers. And, yeah. and one thing I would ask you is yeah. that when you put graphs up, you put numbers up, that you put the source of where that information came from because you had nothing up there, you could present a graph and it was no way to discover how to generate this information. So uh, are you, you uh, should always uh, give you some source information. Oh, where are, where are assumptions? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's all in our, our, our core drivers. Uh, I got a question for you on the on the uh, feature on the social sustainable needs, sustainable inventory or, or uh, investing that you talked about that they're very aware of that they want to do that. If you have that conversation with the millennial and you say, okay, you can have socially sustainable and we can always we're all going to hold hands and, and uh, swim in the warm water, uh, but it's going to cost you money, and if you invest over here, you can make more money. 
is there any justification to believe they're not going to want the money versus the warm and fuzzy feeling? Yes, we, we definitely take that into account. And a lot of our research actually showed that um, a lot of these ESG-focused uh, ETFs and investment uh, mutual funds, a lot of them offer very competitive returns in line with um, that of other traditional funds. And additionally, there's a strong correlation between um, ESG performance as, and financial performance. Um, so we think that uh, for millennials, yes, they are willing to pay a little bit more um, in, in order to make sure that they are having that social impact. And not everyone would be like that, and some people are more focused on a low cost option, the lowest cost option that will give them those returns. However, a large portion of the millennial psyche is focused on um, trying to engage in these uh, social issues. Jumping yeah, off of your time is up. Oh. Thank you. I guess not. <laughs> you guys, this is great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me.